God sent Jesus to be our priest so that in him we would find rest in his work on our behalf. Just as unbelief brings stress, faith brings rest. Hey, this is Mark Milan. This is a Bible study on the book of Hebrews, and this is chapter 4. Hey, I'm so glad you've decided to join. We are studying the book of Hebrews, chapter 4 today. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version. And then uh, what I'd like to do is unpack some notes, and I will close with a couple of thoughts and questions to respond to what God is saying through His Word. Again, we are working uh, in sequence with uh, what the previous chapter has said. So if you haven't watched those, make sure you watch that. We're picking it up on chapter 4 today. And let's see what God has for us. Therefore, since the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. He's referring to the Israelites in the Old Testament. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God said, quote unquote, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. We're talking about work here. We're talking about works and rest. And the argument here is that Jesus's works is what saves us. We're not saved by our works. According to salvation, we want to work to make ourselves righteous and holy. Jesus is our priest. We can rest in his work. We're not trying to make ourselves holy anymore. Jesus has made us holy, and now by the power of his Spirit, we get to live in that holiness, practice that holiness, but I cannot make myself right with God. So this opening paragraph, even though it sounds a little dense, when we're talking about rest and work, we're talking about the work that it takes for a person to, made, to be made right with God, Jesus is the way we are made right with God, and we could enter into His rest. Rest assured that before God, I am accepted because of what Christ has done through His life. Okay? Picking it up, uh, finishing off verse 3. And yet His works have been finished since the creation of the world, referring to Jesus. Verse 4. For somewhere He has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all His works. And again, in the passage above, he says, They shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. He's talking about the Sabbath here. There was a Sabbath day that the people of Israel were supposed to rest, and that was to teach them to trust in God, to teach them that no matter how hard they worked, no matter how hard they wanted to be righteous and holy, God would accomplish it. So he was teaching them to rest one day a week so that they would continually practice their faith and trust in the Lord. So that's that's the context of what we're reading, okay? Picking it up on verse 7. God said again, God again set a certain day calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. He referred to those verses in chapter 3. Picking it up on verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, talking about the Old Testament, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rests also rests from their works. Okay, in other words, when you come into salvation in Jesus Christ, you can rest. Your heart can finally be at ease to know you are accepted by God because of what Christ has done, His works. We're not saved by our works, we're saved by His works for good works. That's in Ephesians, but 
I digress. Let's go back. Verse 10. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by the following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's God's word. Okay, there's, a, there's so much there to unpack, and that could be like a whole message. My, my goal is to kind of give some context and some help, but what we're reading and understanding in chapter 4 is this idea of rest, which started in chapter 3. The people of Israel didn't trust God, so they didn't rest. They didn't trust God. They worked, they worked, and they had the law, and they used the law as a means for for themselves to make themselves right with God. And they never rested. They just, they did everything, everything, everything. It was like religion. Go, 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 do, 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 be better, try harder, right? It was just, it's all up to me to be made right with God, and that's not the plan of salvation. That's not grace. That's the law. The law was given as a precursor to teach us our sin. We get into this in the book of Galatians. We did a Bible study on that, but the law was given to help the people of Israel understand the holiness of God, to understand His nature, but the law could never transform anyone to be holy or to be righteous, So it was given for good reasons. The law is good. It's righteous. Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to destroy the law. I want to be sure that that's communicated. The law is good, but it cannot make me good. What was happening was the people of Israel did not believe that God could do it. So they took on this burden of fulfilling the law and they wouldn't rest. There was no Sabbath. And one of the Ten Commandments was take a Sabbath, rest, rest from your work. And people would disobey God. And because of their disobedience, it created pride. It it allowed sin to come in. And that disobedience led people astray. So chapter 3 introduces, hey, remember that the people of Israel saw the power of God. They saw the greatness of God. They were given, you know, they were given instruction by God, yet they disobeyed. They didn't listen. And unbelief came and robbed them of just resting in the promises of God, resting in knowing that God is my salvation. So as we pick it up in chapter 4, again, we're talking about this rest that comes through the person of Jesus Christ, okay? It's this rest of knowing that my salvation has been secured, that my salvation has been atoned for, that I have a person who is my high priest. Jesus is my high priest. I don't have to go to any pastor or any priest anywhere. I could go directly to God through Jesus Christ because He is the God-man. He came, he was tempted, he struggled, and now I could stand before God and rest. My heart, my soul can rest. It could be at ease. I could feel peace, finally, knowing that I'm accepted by God because of Jesus Christ. To rest is to place your trust in God. Unbelief brings about stress. Faith brings about rest, takes faith to rest. And when we are practicing rest, we are placing our trust in God. Okay, my, uh, my identity, my success, my productivity, my advancement, all those things. When I rest, I say, God, you are the author of all my progress. Everything, that good, everything that's good in my life comes from you. I cannot make anything grow. I cannot make anything flourish. God, you take care of 
me and that it's this belief that God will take care of you. He will take care of me. And when we practice rest, we are uh, taking action in our faith because we are stepping back and letting God do his thing. God rested in the, in, in the book of Genesis, and it wasn't because he was tired. He ref, the author references this, that God took a rest on the seventh day. That word is actually like, um, like an artist. If an artist was painting on a canvas and was adding one more color and adding one more color, and then they look at it, and then they, then they go, that's a rest. That's what God did. He created all things. He created us in his image. He stepped back and he just went, yeah, that's good. That's good. He stepped back to rest. And so he's referencing that God rested. Therefore, we should understand that we should step back. God didn't rest because he was tired. God rested because he was teaching us to rest in him, but also because his work was complete. And when we rest, we are practicing faith that in Jesus, the work is also complete. It takes faith to rest. Say that with me. It takes faith to rest. And then he says, let us make every effort to enter into that rest. Now, that's a kind of an interesting uh, play on words, right? Let me, let me work hard to rest. What he's essentially saying is, yes, your heart, your soul, your mind, your emotions, they're going to continually try to tell you that you have to do, you have to do, you have to do, you have to do, instead of saying, no, Christ has done, Christ has done, Christ has done, in Him it is finished. I have to put in the work reminding myself to enter into that rest. And we have a high priest. What does it mean to have a high priest? That means that I have a, a human being, a person not some spirit, not some mythical uh, ideology, but God came as a man, as a person. He dwelt among us. He was flesh and bone. He understood what it was to be tired. He understood what it was to be tempted. He understood what it was to mean to get upset and to deal with frustration and to deal with setbacks and hunger and all the things that we deal with as humans. He experienced all of that so that he could represent me. He understands me, so I can trust in him. I can run to him. He's not a person that does not understand my situation and doesn't understand yours. Jesus endured it all. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself through Jesus Christ. He understands and he empathizes. He is our high priest, and his work was perfect. And because his work was perfect, he rested. The Bible says he sat down at the right hand of the Father. In other words, he's not still working. The work of his priesthood is accomplished. He did it once and for all. And we'll see that as we get deeper into the chapter where human priests had to do it every year, every day. And once a year, Yom Kippur, the high priest would go in there and, and bring atonement for all the people of Israel, including himself. But the priest was continuously working, continuously bringing offerings before God. Jesus brought himself and he laid it down once for all, and then he rested. In other words, I no longer need to be worried whether or not I'm accepted by God because Jesus accomplished his task as my priest. That's good news. God's throne is a throne of grace. As he closes the chapter, he talks about Joshua when they went into the promised land. They were supposed to receive those promises and again rest that God fulfilled his promise, right? God had spoken of this land and all this blessing and they went in and they still couldn't understand that God would take care of them. And then as he closes it, I love verse 12, such a good reminder for us about the power of the word of God for the word of God is alive and it is active. It speaks as I read it today and I read it tomorrow. It's alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword it penetrates even dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart now that's why this is why 
The Word of God is our authority. We, are, we don't submit to religion. We don't submit to uh, what the church says about God. We submit to the Word of God, and this is one of the reasons. When you read it right here, for the Word of God is alive and active, the Word judges my thoughts and attitudes. When I read God's Word, the Holy Spirit uses it to bring me to a place of transparency and conviction before God. And then I love this contrast. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. God sees everything. Everything is uncovered and laid before his eyes. Now you go, oh my goodness. God sees everything. He sees your thoughts, your actions, your intentions. He sees everything you do when you're alone. He sees absolutely everything, which is a frightening thought. But then he goes, therefore. Therefore. Why is that therefore? That Whenever you see that word therefore, what is it therefore? To make a strong point. Since we have a great high priest who ascended into heaven. Okay, God sees all my junk. He sees everything that I do. Oh my gosh, that terrifies me. Oh, but therefore I have to remember that I have a high priest who represents me. I have to remember that I'm hidden in Christ, that the blood of Jesus covers me. That when God sees me, he sees me through the perfect sacrifice of his son, Jesus Okay, and then it reminds us that we have a high priest who understands our weaknesses. Let us therefore, let us then approach God's throne of grace. Of all the things we could have said of God's throne, God's throne is holy, it's powerful, it's majestic, it's eternal, it's all-knowing, right? Let us approach God's throne of grace. God is a God of grace. Let us approach with confidence, the writer says. You should feel confident. Listen, the, the altar in heaven had a sacrifice, and it's Jesus, and Jesus' uh, Jesus's sacrifice is eternal. That one offering is enough, where the priest had to continuously bring offerings before God, and the believer had to bring offerings constantly for repentance of sin, hoping to wash away their consciousness feeling like they would be rejected by God because of their sinfulness. We have an offering in heaven, an eternal offering, and that offering was accepted through the resurrection. The resurrection is evidence that the offering was accepted by God. He went on the cross, he died, but when he resurrected, that meant the offering is good. The blood is good. It is perfect and it is without spot. It is without blemish. It is received eternally. And now before the throne of God, I can go boldly. I can go like a spoiled little brat before God. And I can say, God, here I am. Here I am. Here's what I'm struggling with. Here's what's going on over here. Hey, oh, Lord, I did this. I'm so sorry. I could go confidently and boldly before the throne. Why? Because it's a throne of grace. And I could go confidently because of what Jesus has done, and I could receive mercy and find grace. You and I can receive mercy and find grace. Why? Because it's covered by the blood. We'll get into this maybe a little bit in one of the other chapters, but it's on my mind to share right now. You know, the the Ark of the Covenant, this, this gold box, had two angels hovering over it, and they were looking down. They were looking at each other facing the center of the top of the Ark, and on the top of the Ark, they call it the mercy seat because the priest in the Old Testament would sprinkle blood on top of the ark and they would do that during Yom Kippur they would go in there and they would sprinkle it seven times there was blood on the top it's the mercy seat it represents the blood of Jesus well why is that important that's important because if you opened up the ark inside of the ark was the law inside of the ark was the rod of Aaron inside of the ark was um, the manna it was it, it, all the things that represented our failure our rebellion and our sinfulness all those things were inside of the ark all the things that we were given that we just could not get our act together right we just couldn't put it together to be made right with God God covered it with a lid he said I don't want to see that what I want to see is the blood I want to see the blood of Jesus and the blood is on top it's on top of the mercy seat so I am covered in the blood you are covered in the blood when God looks at us he sees the blood of Jesus Therefore, I could enter in with great boldness and confidence. Ah, oh, it's so good. I could have a just a worship moment right now. It's so good. The, the mercy and grace of God. All right, let's close with a couple of 
questions. Do you find it hard to rest and trust in God's promises? Do you find it hard to rest and trust in God's promises? Question number two. When you approach God's throne, do you feel accepted or afraid? When you approach God's throne, do you feel accepted or afraid? And I don't want to unpack those two questions. I just want the Holy Spirit to lead you in both of them. I just think they're, they're set up to have some profound conversations and reflection with the Lord. And I pray that the Lord would reveal His great mercy and grace to you and the great gift of Jesus Christ, who is our eternal High Priest. Oh man, this is getting good. Hebrews chapter 4. I um, hope you're learning something. Every time I read it, I learn something myself. So I'm excited. We'll pick it up on the next one.